Okay, so this is going to be a joint talk by myself uh, and Ross, who are in the opposite orders. And we haven't met before. We've never met before. <laughs> We've uh, in the virtual world. Uh, so we're from Australia and Canada, respectively. But actually, it's really nice uh, for me to be here because Darmstadt is where I was born and raised. So, oh, oh, yes. Wow. yes. Um, okay, so, um, so we will talk about this. PDFX package, which uh, uh, can produce uh, uh, PDF documents out of LaTeX sources, which comply with sort of various standards that, that we've, uh, and some of which we've already heard about this morning. So, um, <clears throat> for example, many universities nowadays require theses to be um, to be delivered in PDFA. Okay, and this is in fact how I started working on this because one of my students graduated. And we were trying to figure out how in the world are we going to generate a PDFA document, you know, from a from a mathematical thesis, which was obviously written in tech. So briefly, again, we've already heard some of this. So PDFA is one of the many standards, but A stands for archiving. So so the, the focus of PDFA is not accessibility, but in fact long-term preservation of the document. So for example, a PDFA document should not depend on any external fonts. All fonts must be embedded, color information must be embedded. The whole document has to be completely self-contained. Um, there are also a couple of other uh, requirements. One of them is Unicode mapping, so that all the content um, is actually marked up with Unicode uh, uh, characters. Um, then there's also a requirement to in in include metadata in a machine-readable form, things like title, uh, abstract, authors, keywords, and other kinds of metadata. And, um, and then there's um, a requirement for logical document structure, so the sort of tagged PDF that we, that we heard about before. Um, that's sort of the strict standard of PDFA, which is called PDFA-1A. Mm -hmm. There's also a less strict standard, PDF-1B, which doesn't have all the requirements, only has a subset of them, presumably to help people actually adopt these standards when they're not quite able to do all the tagged. So um, there's actually, so when ISO standardizes something, standardizes, it immediately means there's going to be 25 different versions of five different standards that come up in three different revisions. And each of these standards, by the way, costs several hundred dollars probably to buy. So, so mostly when we're trying to be compliant with the standards, we work with secondary documents. Uh, where someone has described the standard in the document we can download for free. Because actually, I am not usually paying all that money just to read an ISO standard. But anyway, so there's, there's several different of these related ISO uh, uh, PDF standards. So PDFA is for archiving, mostly focusing on self-containedness and so on. PDFX is another important one used in print production. So in print production, colors are much more important than, say, you know, in a, in a research paper. There's a certain red that you're all familiar with called the Coca-Cola red, right? Yes. And it looks the same if you see it on a can of metal or if you see it on a printed poster or if you see it in a glossy magazine. It's always the same color. It's not just an RGB color, you know, like you're used to uh, coding in HTML. It's actually a physical color that sort of would look the same to the human eye no matter which different medium it's printed on. So to control color to such a large extent that people have really trademarked you know, certain colors and so on, you use these things called uh, International Color Consortium Color Profiles. And these things are very common and important in the printing world, although most people who just write math papers might have never heard of them. <laughs> so, so PDFX is a, is a PDF standard very much focused on this print production process and color profiles. And of course, they don't use RGB. They use uh, the other one, YMCK or whatever and, and so on. Right. Then there are a few other standards. So we, uh, PDFE is used for engineering workflows. And I have no idea what that means. But I imagine it's producing something like blueprints for an architect that's going to be used in some workflow. Uh, PDF BT is variable and transactional printing. Again, I don't really know what that's actually used for. Um, and, and PDF UA is the universal accessibility that we've already heard about you know, in, the, in the previous talks. So um, uh, as was already mentioned, also by Olaf, validation of compliance with these standards is actually an issue, right? Because if the US government makes a law saying that every PDF document has to be PDF UA, Someone actually has to decide if that's the case or not, right? There has to be some, some, some validation 
And there's two kinds of validation. There's automatic validation done by tools such as uh, Adobe Reader. And you just, uh, there's a box, you know, it, it says yes, it's a PDF A document. No, it's not. And then there's another box where you can fix the problems. And, but, but many of the standards, for example, you can easily have an automated tool checking that there's metadata. For example, that you didn't forget to fill in the title field. But you can't have an automated tool, tool uh, uh, checking if the metadata is appropriate or if you actually spell the author's name correctly, or you know, you can check if all the math formulas have been marked as formulas, but you can't really check if the, if the screen reader text actually captures the semantics correctly. But these requirements are part of the, of the various standards, so there has to be a human actually checking standards compliance also. Um, now, there's automated tools available, including from Adobe, for taking any PDF document and just converting it to, to compliant PDF A, for example. It's just a box saying fix, and it will sort of fix all of the problems. But of course, it will only pass the automated checks because it will, for example, put an empty title and an empty author and empty uh, uh, text for all the, for, for all the um, <coughs> formulas and so on. So, so of course, when we want to produce PDF A from LaTeX documents, we want to produce, produce quality PDF A so there's a lot of this meta information already present in the document source. And of course, uh, for the typical user, all you just want to do is backslash use package PDFX, and you want all the correct metadata and, you, and all the encodings and so on to produce, produce completely transparently. So to a certain extent, it's possible to do that. In a few places, you need to add a bit of markup, you know, sort of optional markup that, that, that you have to add if you want quality documents. So the PDFX package was first written by, um, by these people. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and, um, uh, the, the, the first version was very experimental. Actually, if you looked at the, at, the, at the documentation, it said you can download such and such from here, and we tried that, and you might want to, and it, you had to do sort of a lot of things by hand. And so this year, both Ross and I sort of independently started working on really fixing up this package. And, and I've been working on it for at least a year. So he's been working on it forever, <laughs> and I started working on it this year. <laughs> so, so now a lot of the things sort of work out of the box. Uh, many of the bugs have been fixed and features added. So let me talk about a few of these features in, in a little bit of, not too much detail. So I already said what color profiles are. Um, most color profiles are not free. It always says in the documentation, well, you can download such and such from Adobe's website, and then maybe it's free in the sense that you don't have to pay for it, but we couldn't include an Adobe uh, a color profile with a, with a LaTeX package and distribute it on CTAN, because the license doesn't allow that. So one of the things we did is we actually found somewhere a, a set of color packages that actually were freely distributable, and we've added those to the package so that the typical user doesn't have to go and download their own color profile from, from somewhere. Um, I, I'll give you an example of Unicode mapping if I can actually whoa, go to, so this is my, my student's uh, PhD, uh, sorry it's a master's thesis, let me just see, it's weird because uh, I can't get this to be full screen right now, okay Jennifer, that must be right. Right, so this is a non-PDF, a uh, PDF generated just from LaTeX. Um, typically, you're familiar with what, happened, what would happen if you were to copy and paste from such a document, right? So, go here to definition five, for example. So, I don't have a cursor. Ah, here it is. So, you copy and paste here. Okay, that's obviously not going to work. It's, uh, I don't see on my screen what I see on the big screen, so, because uh, I didn't turn screen uh, uh, mirroring on, which was probably a, a mistake. So if we copy here, and then we go to the desktop, which is now somewhere else. Whoa, 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 sorry for all the blinking. Okay, that's not what I want. So where was I? Okay, let me try this again. So copy, and then uh, where do I find my... Uh, here, 
paste. So this is what you typically see when you copy and paste from a LaTeX generated PDF document. You didn't do anything special. So we'll, you will notice, for example, that ligatures have disappeared because they're just not mapped to any, to any sort of font uh, you know, in the, by PDF. So it says definition instead of definition or, um, uh, you know, like if you have a word like efficient, it will look really terrible after that. You'll see that none of the math symbols have been mapped. Um, Greek letters have disappeared. And, and uh, uh, so one by one matrix, the times, have, all the math symbols have basically disappeared. So that's because the font hasn't been properly Unicode mapped. So if you do this with a PDF A document, uh, let me go on to the PDF A version of the same document here then um, you will see that uh, it, it'll actually look much better. So same definition. Here I have definition 5. Again, I have to make it selectable. Uh, and again, I have to find my X term again. So if you do that now, you will actually have a bunch of math symbols. There's the time symbol here. Definition will look correctly. There's the less or equal. You have, you know, it, don't have things like superscripts and subscripts because they're not actually preserved in the PDF markup and you can't, Unicode doesn't actually provide for them, but you do have many of the symbols. So even for things like screen readers, like Ross was showing, you don't want to hear definition, but you want to hear definition, right? And that's, so that, for example, happened here. Say again? You still lost a Greek letter. I still lost a Greek letter. I'm not supposed to, oh, that's only because, that's actually only because of, I don't have the font installed, so if yeah. I go to. <laughs> yeah, it's just the X term. Uh, it's just the X term, pro yeah, and yeah. I can normally make it. Yeah. Uh, so the only difference between those two documents is one was typeset with PDFX, or is there more than that? No, one of them was typeset with PDFX. That's the only difference. So right. for just one line input package PDFX, and that's all. Uh, for no. this, for what <laughs> I was <laughs> for, for the particular feature that I was just showing you, that's actually true. But there's okay. other things uh, that you can that you must sort of add by hand. So, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to the other screen to because um, that's the only way I can change the font size. So actually, there is a Greek symbol here. Whoops! I just changed to a smaller font. Oh, sorry. Of course, they had to put the podium at an angle, which yeah. is particularly useful if you're trying to balance a laptop on it. <laughs> okay, so Greek symbol, everything's fine, right? That's fine. So let me go back to my presentation now, if indeed I can find it. Screen mirroring is definitely a nice thing. Okay, so here's another example where you have some math symbols. Again, you don't see subscripts and superscripts, but you see the other kind of stuff. Uh, sorry, this cable is dangling on the floor and it keeps pulling itself out. <coughs> All right. Yeah, now we have an image so to be able to Oh, I have the same problem Ross had before. I have to switch back to the little pointer thingy. Uh -huh. Okay, good. It's Metadata. Try this. Yeah, that's, I hope you put it on there. That's a good idea. And you hit on top of that. It's okay. Just uh, let's not touch it. And uh -huh. it work. Okay, another thing is metadata. If you go in, in Acrobat Reader, for example, you go under File, Properties, whatever, Usually the metadata will be empty, but there is, and here's an example of a document where there is metadata, so things like the title, and you can also use Unicode in, in these sort of titles, which is useful if you have a foreign name, or if it's a math formula, or something like that. And, um, okay. Okay, I'll try page down. I'll try page up. This is annoying. I have a cursor, okay. Right, so, okay, so what do you have to do? You have to, first of all, include use package PDFX at the beginning of the file, but of course, things like metadata doesn't write itself automatically. Even though you have a backslash title, uh, you know, element in, in LaTeX, people don't always use it for the title. Sometimes someone uses it for the date or uses the date one for the affiliation <laughs> and so on. So it's difficult to actually extract the metadata automatically. And besides, uh, it may not be in the correct format if you have, say, uh, some markup or Unicode or something in there. 
So the way it's done in the PDFX package is you have a separate file called jobname.xpmp data, and in there you just define the metadata, and then it gets transparently included. And it's just basically a list of keys and attributes where there's certain predefined keys like backslash author, um, as is shown here. Um, and there's several of these are predefined, author, title, keyword, subject, publisher, copyright, copyright, blah, 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 journal number, page number. There's a bunch of sort of metadata fields that are just predefined. And in principle, it's not currently user extensible. You'd have to hack a little bit to add more fields, but it's essentially relatively easy to do for the package maintainers. This is probably already more fields than most people would actually need. And in this metadata file, you can also use any ASCII symbol. Certain ones are escaped. And importantly, you can use uh, the UTF-8 encoding for your name or any math symbols and so on. And that was actually a part that was a bit finicky to implement. And I'll say something about that. Um, and right now, only the UTF-8 encoding is possible in this XMP data file. You can't use Latin 1 or your other favorite encoding. And there's some sort of technical reason for that. The Unicode mapping is implemented in a file called glyph to unicodetech and it's just a long list of font glyphs and the corresponding Unicode character. Again, it's the sort of thing, of course, if you have some very exotic font that has not yet been mapped, you might have to provide the mapping yourself, but most of the standard sort of fonts have been done and is already included automatically. Um, now, the, the UTF-8 in the metadata was really a finicky thing to implement. Uh, the, w the way tech uses input encodings, it's actually a two-phase process because tokens are first, um, oh, sorry, and uh, right, so one of the reasons it's finicky is that within the tagged PDF file, that metadata, some of that metadata has to uh, appear in two different places. In something called the metadata block and somewhere else called the info structure or whatever of the PDF file. And it's a requirement that both of these are identical but one has to be UTF-8 encoded, and the other one has to be UTF-16 encoded. <laughs> now, trying to use all of these encodings, sort of, you know, it's just a little bit finicky, let's say. Not difficult, but finicky. Um, when you do an input encoding in tech, it's actually a two-step process, because first you scan your token. So the way this works is all the characters that could be part of the UTF-8 code are just made active. And later, there's macro expansion, where all these active characters do things like looking up what the next character is and then turning into the appropriate, uh, unit, you know, the appropriate code point and so on. But it's a two-step process. So of course, ma that scanning doesn't happen at the same time as macro expansion necessarily. So it's quite possible to, to change the encoding between the two steps, right? UTF-8, then you define a macro, then you change the input encoding, and then you expand the macro. Very unexpected things will happen, right? <laughs> Typically, that's not how you're supposed to use input encodings. But in this package implementation, we actually used exactly this effect as a trick in order to make it work so that it could translate UTF-8 into these various different other things. So, so we have made a custom input encoding called 8-bit, which does nothing except turning all the characters into active. And then there's sort of, we either reproduce it verbatim, then it's UTF-8, or else we pass it to the PDF string def command and then it becomes UTF-16. So it's kind of a hack and maybe in a future version it could be made a little bit better. So these are all the known deficiencies of the current package version and now Ross is going to tell you about things that are gonna come up in the next release or one of the next okay. releases. I need to get mine up now. So you're going to have to swap the machines around again. So right. Which will mm. probably be an improvement. So this is the right one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, 
Okay, so let's get to this list. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I think that's pretty much the same as what you had. Okay, so okay, so the thing is the current version of pdfx.sty that's in probably on the discs that you all got in your conference bags is everything that what Peter has just told you is applicable to that version. And I'm going to tell you what else we can do. Okay, so we're going to gradually cross these things off. So, um, Luatech is now supported. Um, there was really only one, well, no, there's two issues there. First issue was to do with um, MD5 sum and Luatech had a way of implementing working out MD5 sums. This is required as part of the metadata for, well, as part of the PDF info, I think, that required the MD5 sums. So it turned out that just by using the routine that Luatech provides instead of the one that PDF Tech provides, then that just sort of went through. So, so if we can now do that. The other second, second issue with, with Luatech it relates down to printing out the um, media boxes, crop boxes and all of that, and we haven't actually done that part of it yet, but about two weeks ago we got a, an email from someone who has been working on that kind of thing, and so hopefully we'll be able to get that, that in. Um, okay, so we can now do pretty much all of the PDFX standards the different colour profiles. Um, the ones, the hard ones were the ones with the external colour profiles. There's still some issues there. Um, probably we should see some examples. Um, yeah, so let's see if this works. Okay, oh, I actually, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be in full screen mode for the examples. Okay, so this is a, um, so this is a simple example which most LaTeX people will recognise. It's the simple LaTeX document. Um, and so now this is you. Okay. Okay, so that one's doing PDF. This one's the PDFE. Um, so that was one of the other things. We couldn't do PDFE before. Now we can. Okay. And here, this is interesting. In the, in the new um, Adobe, the standards box it tells you the standard that's been satisfied. It gives you the official name. Um, and other information hasn't yet been verified, so we can do that. Uh, except that it doesn't give us the button to do the verifying for, for this particular one. In other standards, there's actually a button that you can press that's going to be down here that does the verification and goes through. So that's actually a bug in Acrobat somewhere. But, um, and, and then it tells you the output intent that's, and the colour profile that's being used here. So this is an RGB one, and, um, and that can go. So why don't we verify it? So there should be a button to pre-flight, but it's not showing. So I've installed it up the top here. And now we can do open up pre-flight and verify compliance. And see, everything's fine. Um, nothing's done. Oh, everything's done. Um, Preflight is actually one of uh, Olaf's, um, well, it comes with Adobe Acrobat, but the work is actually done by Callus Software, so that's Olaf's domain and so on. So, so this is pretty good. And you can do great stuff with this. You can, so I want to have a quick little bit of a look. You can even browse the internal structure. And the nice thing here is that, okay, here you can go through this. The, the page tree and you can look at everything on the page, but I don't really want to do that. If we're more interested in the metadata, then you click on that one and you have a look. So here's the document root catalog and it links through to the XML metadata. So this is the stuff from the XMP file comes up into here. Um, it tells you the output intent. So this should correspond to the information over there. And all of that comes through. Okay, now here's the document info. So here's all the stuff that goes in the document info, and you see everything sort of loaded there. Um, we've populated a lot of that, but not necessarily all of it. Okay, so that's, so that's an example of a PDFE document, which previously, well, you can't do that yet, but with the next version you will be able to. You'll be able to reduce to get this. Um, if I wanted to open a PDFX file, so let's 
see if I'm in the right place here, PDFX. All right, so look, I'm just going to open these out a little bit to show you all the different kinds of things that we can, we can now actually support. Um, these tag PDF ones are from my earlier examples, the 2013 one, which Olaf showed. Um, okay, examples with external color profiles, example with embedded color profiles. Okay, so these ones are all different names of different color profiles. Um, okay, I've got Acrobat Pro on my machine. I have a copy of of the Acrobat or the Adobe Color Profiles. They come with the Acrobat distribution. They're hidden a long way down in subdirectories of your application bundle and all of that. Um, and so I can create documents that use those. Not everyone else can. However, what we now do is we provide a file that just gives you a simple macro name that brings it, that does everything for those color profiles. So that's what's going to be in the the next issue. Um, and then the external profiles are when, okay, so these are actually links to, okay, so these are links to where they are in other places. So it doesn't, so you can't judge anything from the file size. The, all of these files here, the PDFs are close to a megabyte. And almost 100% of that is the color profile. There's very little actual data in those files. But the color profile, which is a mapping of colors to colors, and that's a three-dimensional space, so it's sampled, whatever, that's a big amount of data, much more than what we're used to putting into our uh, math manuscripts in, in LaTeX. So most of the document is actually taken up with describing how the colors work, and for scientific paper, most of that's irrelevant. <laughs> so that's a lot of wasted stuff, just to satisfy a standard. Okay, so what external profiles do is say, well, all right, you know, you're using Acrobat to view things, so is the guy that you want to send it to, so let's tell him what colour profile we used, and he can, he can put that in himself and do whatever he needs with the colour profile. It doesn't have to be embedded in the document. We can now support that too. Supporting that, though, is actually more difficult than embedding because, you, you, again, you need to provide the MD5 sum of the, of the actual profile file, and so there's more bookkeeping involved, and all of that is something that you don't, the average person isn't going to want to do. So we've encoded that up into macros, and it's exactly the same macros as are used for these ones. They just expand to something different when you're doing, including the pro, embedding the profile or not embedding the profile. Okay, so that's the work that's been done on that, and I've got examples to show that. But what's our time like? We, yeah, that's what I thought. So I didn't really have time to show too many of those explicitly. Um, Okay, PDFAs, we have some, yeah, some examples there of PDFA1Bs. Um, I think what I wanted, well, PDFVT, there wasn't, this is a very interesting one. What happens there, this is like when you're doing uh, mailing list outs, okay? And when you're doing a mailing list, every page is for a different person or their information, so maybe it's the utility bills from, you know, from the electricity company or whatever, and you've got, the document is structured, but basically it's the same structure on every page, so you've got one piece of structure and then filling in the forms happening on different pages, and the idea of PDFVT is it optimises the printing for that. So again, it's related to printing, but you have to impose a very strict structure in your document, and so this one, I have one example that's done with LaTeX um, and it requires you to know the actual object numbers of, the, of different objects inside the PDF file, right? So you can actually, if you've, because the document is so regular, every, you're not adding extra fonts after the first one or two pages, then you can actually predict what those are going to be in that document, but not necessarily in the next one that you do. So then you've got to go back and for the next one, you've then got to do, there's a bit of non-deterministic stuff here at the moment. And so what we've done is requested that Hantatan add the ability to find out what the actual object number is of the last built page so that you can actually produce the correct 
tag, um, tag structure and actually get this happening. So that's something not for the next release, but for maybe a bit further on. But we can, it, this can be done. Um, so, okay, so what I've tried to do is to, okay, so let's, oh, okay, cancel that. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Where is it? Oh, yeah, so this, this new interface is, some things just don't quite work the way you think they would work. Um, no, where's it gone? Oh, maybe I'm going to have to open it up again. Yeah, we, we've lost track of where we were, where we are. So let's close those, and then just go through. Okay. So Lua Tech, we can handle each of those different color profiles. We can handle and providing utility macros that actually make them work very easily. Okay, PDFE, we can now do PDFET partial support. You can actually have a document that satisfies more than one standard at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now that is a little bit tricky. The tricky part comes in the XMP packet. The document info, that's, that's easy. You just put in the appropriate tags and it, when you're verifying for one standard it finds the tag. When you're verifying the other it finds the, the tag. But when you actually have to check that up and, and verify the XMP data, then you actually have to do what's called uh, PDFA extension schema and actually define everything that one kind of validation is looking for in term, so that it's available to, for the other kind of validation. And that gets tricky. That's, that's a lot harder. So we haven't quite finished that yet, but we do have some examples that actually work. So we know what we're doing there. Um, okay. The UTF-8 only within XMP data, as, as Peter was saying. Um, well, now we can actually, what I've done now is to extend that UTF-8 encoding um, and load a file that within that, so when that encoding is loaded, then the um, NFS um, or the font encoding, all of the stuff that's been developed over the last decade for font encodings can now actually output the UTF-8 bytes that you require in response to using ordinary ASCII kind of macros for accents and for special characters. Okay. Um, the question that I have there for the experts in this field is how much of this do we actually have to do? Right? I can find out what all this information is for every single Cyrillic letter and accent combination and special characters in Cyrillic and Greek and Vietnamese and all of that. But how much of that do you actually want loaded? Because that all takes up space inside the document and, you know, we want it, we want the documents to be, we want the package to be usable by people not just in America, Australia, England and here in Europe, but all around the world. So that kind of thing has to be supportable, but how much is actually needed to be loaded in any given document? <coughs> so there's an issue there. Um, the Adobe profiles here supported by macros. Okay, I said, already said, said that earlier with, with in point two. And then part eight, well, this will happen. We will we'll find out. I don't know enough about the problem yet and how it should be solved. But, the, the, okay, the issue is that um, the way the package is currently set up, it loads a, a fixed media box size at the beginning of the document and that goes through for every page and is used on every page. But of course, the pages don't all have to be the same size. And, you know, the original XPDF package was written by Hunter Tan and uh, Radhakrishnan because they have a printing company and they're all producing lots of documents all of the same size and everything's fine. So we're fine for them. And we've picked that up and moved on, but we haven't yet handled, put in the effort to handle this aspect of it yet. So that's pretty much what, what will be happening. So these are the points, most of them are covered, but of course that, that coding is not available yet to anyone except me, so, and Peter. So. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>